Our season has taken us to faraway places such as Belgium, Austria, the Netherlands, and even Italy. But with this being a North American-based club, we're going to end it at one of the most iconic tracks in the U.S., Daytona. Get ready for a real fight for the title as we get ready to watch the PCA Sim Racing Series 11 Club Class. You'll see it all live here on Race Spot TV. I am Joe Peek, and with me in the booth tonight is Reese Gardner, and behind the scenes is our director, Ramiro Cisneros. Reese, uh, this is where it starts to get pretty serious now. Club class here at Daytona, we're starting to get well up there in talent. Yeah, absolutely we are. We've uh, already been through the uh, the entry class and the challenge class uh, over the last week, and now we go to of course club um i'm expecting a bit of an increase in lap times or a decrease in lap times if uh, if you want to flip it that way obviously daytona is uh, one of the tracks where talent is going to be a big element um it's a simple enough track but if you're able to put the power down properly, then you'll gain buckets of time. As we check out the standings here, Klaus Nielsen obviously on top by some margin. There is still potential for Matthew Jokel and Terence Tong to take the title, though. Yeah, very slight chance, unfortunately, for them. Velez, uh, Fernandez, McKinney, all mathematically too far out. But Matt and Terence definitely need a little luck coming their way. Look at the battle down there, though, from six on back there is only 12 points from six to tenth where they could see a lot of swapping around as they are uh just in practice right now uh, with uh, about half of that left to go before they're sent off into the qualifying and in contrast to both last week's races with challenge and sport and well as uh, as well as the race we had earlier this week with entry, this now enters us into the open setup categories with club racing. And it's always gonna be a question at Daytona, Reese, of who can trim out the car for the top end speed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Daytona International Speedway, obviously combined oval and road course, and the majority of the track is an oval. There is a twisty infield section, though, where you can gain a bit of time if you put a little more downforce on the car and try and engineer it more for the hairpins. But uh, considering the amount of time you spend on full throttle, it's almost always the better option to trim the car out for the oval section. But fast corners like the Le Mans chicane will certainly put paid to that. If uh, you can't get the balance just right, it then becomes a balance of how hard you can push without losing the car with not as much aerodynamic grip available to you. Now, once we get into that qualifying session, don't forget that if we're not showing your favorite driver and how they're doing, as well as during the race, uh, you can check out our live time. We've got a link in the uh, YouTube chat, so you can check that out at any time to kind of see how your desired driver is doing as we watch David Glenn and now Brett Holmes on their way around uh, the infield for David out of the Western Horseshoe and into that oval portion where we just talked about the need for that high speed. Now, we mentioned that uh, Yo uh, Jokel and Tong have opportunity to try and take the championship away from Nielsen. Here's the situation. With the drop points that Nielsen has, it puts him 23 points clear no matter what of those two, uh, no matter what they score. So the only way for them to take the championship is to get a win and hope that Nielsen crashes out and gets a zero. So it's, it's going to take uh, a bit of bad luck for Klaus uh, and also uh, basically a perfect performance from Jokel and Tom. Yeah, certainly. I mean, anything can happen, but uh, at the moment, it does seem that Klaus Nielsen is in the box seat for the title, and there isn't going to be much anyone can do to overcome him. We'll have to wait and see what his times are in qualifying and whether or not he can hold on to the car in the 40-minute race coming up now. Times are filing in in practice. Currently, Joachim Bakker is the one on top. Uh, we're seeing Brett Holmes put in his first time to put him into sixth. Drivers obviously practicing pit entry as well because a pit stop will be required in this race uh, for a little bit of fuel, maybe some tires if you have the time for that, but we're not expecting too much in the way of tire stops. These are GT3 cars, so the tires will be able to easily last for that time span. 
hundred percent. And uh, not to mention, we're racing at the night, as you can see. So uh, cool conditions, not going to be making it super slick out there where those fresh tires could make much of a difference out on the track anyways. As uh, down through the kink we go and continuing on through perhaps the most narrow part of the track here before it opens up once again uh, out on to the oval. They're getting a little chatter from race control, letting them know what's expected for this final round. Series 11 has gone on for a, a, a fair few races at this point. Uh, we are into round seven, event number seven on the schedule. And all five of the classes have been racing each of them. So there have been a lot going on. We've seen so much action and it's starting to now come to a close. So if you have anything left in the tank, if you have a point you're trying to prove, now is the time you got to do it. Exactly right. Just keeping an eye on everyone out on track, seeing if there are any points to prove in practice. Well, Matthew Jokel has uh, managed to improve his practice time. We're seeing um, more times in the 144s than I've ever seen uh, in PCA. Um, obviously, the, the lower classes racing over the past week, we saw the times gradually decrease from, you know, the low 1 minute 45s into the mid 144s, even the low 144s occasionally will get this. Everyone in the top five has set a time in the 1 minute 44 second bracket. So it's fast, it's competitive. I can't wait for the racing to go off here. Obviously, qualifying comes first, then we'll see exactly how fast these cars really are. Yeah, and that's just the warm-up, so that isn't even uh, with everybody probably pushing at 10 tenths here. So we could see even more of these drivers tick into the 144s, maybe some 143s from some of the top drivers as well. They do a pretty good job of putting everybody into these classes so that they are competitive. They have a system uh, that they use based on uh, uh, the average uh, results of the drivers over the course of the season to kind of figure out uh, how everybody is running and, and seeing if it's worth uh, uh, promoting them up a class or down a class and, and whatnot. But it looks like that qualifying session is now starting. They only get three laps to set a competitive time. They've got 10 minutes to try and do so, which will be plenty to try and uh, uh, get those three laps in. But once you use up those three laps, that's it. Indeed. And Daytona is notorious for having a couple of corners where it's very easy to get an off-track 1X and lose your lap, particularly at the Le Mans chicane. I've uh, definitely experienced the pain of being at the end of a qualifying lap and running just a little too deep into that chicane on the oval back stretch, just catching the grass with one wheel, and that is the lap over, completely invalidated. Let's see how many drivers experience that same level of pain here tonight. Nielsen already out on track. He wants to get his laps done and out of the way as soon as possible. Yeah, you bring up a good point about how the Le Mans chicane is, is the last bit that you have to get right. That's kind of diabolical in a way because you can yeah. have this great lap going and you can't afford to back off into that chicane because it empties onto the one of the longest straights. So if you take it easy through there, you're going to lose all that you made up. Exactly. It's uh, you, you've really got to be dancing on the knife edge of do I nail it and gain the time or do I push just a little bit too hard and face the potential of my entire lap being invalidated. Obviously, the conditions are optimum for uh, a good amount of front end grip. It's only 19 degrees Celsius track temperature. So... I think there'll be a lot of grip available to the drivers out here. That will tempt them into pushing a little bit harder. And there's been plenty of updates to the Daytona road course over the last 12 months on iRacing, uh, reflecting updates to the track in real life. A little bit more curb at the final chicane uh, certainly helps drivers to hit their marks a little better. But then, once again, you're dancing on the knife edge. Do you uh, push a little bit harder, knowing that you have the curbs to gather you up? That's the question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and if you push that just a teeny bit too far, then, well, there goes that good lap and all that hard work. As now we're seeing the uh, official hot lap start as drivers have gone by the timing line at speed this time. Watching to see the comparison between Klaus and Matt. 
as they are two of our protagonists for this championship, this title for the club class here at the end of Series 11. Down into the breaking for the Western Horseshoe. This is looking nice and tidy for Klaus so far. Yeah, it is. He's um, obviously not pushing too hard on his first lap. Um, it's ideal to try and get a banker in before uh, you actually start pushing on your second and third laps. And Klaus hitting all of his marks very nicely. Already a little bit faster than Matthew Jokel in Sector 1. Let's see what Sector 2 brings as he comes down uh, to the Le Mans chicane. Just narrow the exit coming out of the... Uh, NASCAR turn two and blend over to the right hand side to open up the entry to the chicane. It looks like Nielsen is nailing the curbs nicely. Jokel pushing as well. It's a nice clean run through it for both of them. Well, sector two's not showing up for Jokel on my screen. I wonder if he did have him off track there somewhere. Mm. Maybe that's why that's that's not turning up. I'm not as familiar with how that would represent there on our timing and Nielsen We'll find out soon. He's coming to the line now. And as Velez is the first to take a time, it'll put him at the top temporarily. And Nielsen, a 44-7, is actually behind Julian Velez in that number 33. And by three and a half tenths of a second. Yeah, so that, that tells me that that was just a banker for Klaus Nielsen. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he's aware he's got three laps to do. As long as he puts a time on the board and it puts him round about in the top 10, he'll be happy with that and uh, he'll be able to uh, execute the race from there. But uh, now this offers him the opportunity to push a little more. Here's Baker coming down to the timing line. Where is that going to put the number... 001. It'll jump him up into second. Yoakum with a fantastic first lap there. 44 5 3 5. He's within under two tenths uh, behind Julian Velez. Still nobody seems able to touch that. 33 is Nielsen is around and he is going to mm. end his qualifying. Oh dear. All right. That's a big problem there for Klaus Nielsen. Um, he, uh, I don't think he'll, it'll be the complete end of his qualifying session. He is emerging back out onto the racetrack now. He just made a mistake coming out of the infield section. He has enough time to get another lap on the board, but that's some extra pressure that he won't want to deal with. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Thank you for that catch. He, uh, his second lap will get deleted here, but uh, he'll come around and be allowed to do the third now. Terrence Tong, his first lap was good enough for only 10th. Second one is a 45-5, or 44-5, which is a half a second faster and actually good enough to bump him ahead of Klaus Nielsen. Now, Klaus doesn't need to fret right now because like we said, I mean, it, it, he's even if he scores, uh, no points today. He's The other drivers still need to take a win to be able to beat him. So if he's anywhere above two points, in fact, I think if it, he only needs four points today to, to put himself out of reach. Yeah, so uh, honestly, it's just a case of does he finish or does he retire? That That's the only uh, kind of pressure that Nielsen will have on him in the race, but he'd still like to start as far up the field as he can. And with uh, that lap from Terence Tong, uh, Brett Holmes as well, uh, getting a lap faster than him. Jokel improving to second spot. Nielsen is looking at a sixth place start here. So it's all on for him as he's come out of the Le Mans chicane on his uh, outlap. And he will try to get down into the low 144s. Will Jokel be able to improve on this lap here? It's, just, it's the final lap here for Matthew Jokel. And he's not sticking to the inside coming out of the turn there. Uh, of course, that's onto the back stretch, so it's not as much of a time loss as it would be if you were doing it out of NASCAR 4. That's something that you'll see all the time at Daytona here. Drivers sticking to the inside coming out of this oval turn. It shortens the run to the start-finish line by a few meters. Not much, but it could be crucial. Velez also takes his final lap and it's a 44-3-3-9. He goes even quicker 
Jokel now has to make up a tenth and a half. He'll cross. It's a 44-4. It is not going to be enough. He does improve, but it's not going to change his position. Baker still has to come around. Tong doesn't go faster than fourth. We're still waiting for Klaus Nielsen, who has since been shuffled into eighth. He really needs to nail this last nap, last lap. Indeed he does. David Snelling crossing the line, 20th place for him. We saw big improvements from Dane and Fairburn and Mark Collingwood there getting up into 6th and 7th. That's the reason why Klaus Nielsen is down in 8th right now. Uh, still waiting for a quicker time from Patrick Adamchik as well, trying to break into the 144 second bracket. We've got the top 14 in the 144s here, all covered by um, less than six tenths. Late improvement from Joachim Backer, meanwhile. He gets down to a 144.45. That's good enough for second place right now, but we'll keep our eyes here on Klaus Nielsen as he tries to make his way to the line. Chris Sherburn as well on his final lap. He will have time to complete that. But Nielsen coming to the line. Is this going to be an improvement for him? Is this what he's looking for? 144.57 gets up to fifth. A mild improvement, probably not what he wanted. Again, it's not the end of the world. Fifth place, even if he finishes there, or loses five more and finishes 10th, he's still good. I double checked and uh, 17th place or higher will clinch it for, uh, for Nielsen here today. So that's the number that he needs to aim for as the last of our drivers hit the line here. Chris Sherburn uh, amongst them. Uh, actually, I just checked, and Chris looks like he has set all three of his laps, so he can't do any more from there. And it doesn't look like any other driver is able to set a time, even with these 40 seconds left. Only driver that was unable to put one on the board was Kim Fricky in the number 66. But 26 out of our 27 drivers did get something representative. J.R. Gregory also on uh, his final run here as well looks like drivers are just using this in lap here to practice the pit lane one more time but i don't think gregory's going to be able to get to the pit lane in time this of course being a solo qualifying session it's a hard cut right at the end clock hits zero and you're on a lap too bad you're not able to finish it but um like you said joe all drivers have set their laps that is the end of the session and now we can go into the race. Last chance for the club drivers as they start to grid up here. And as we mentioned, Julian Velez taking pole. Julian has not had a win yet in Series 11. So we'll see if he can finally break that trend as a backer in the 001 will start from P2. Matthew Jokel will start from third. Pretty good start for him to try and steal that title, but he'll need to make a couple passes. Terrence Tong, same for him. On the same row as his rival that he's tied in points. Then you've got Klaus Nielsen starting directly behind him in fifth. Brett Holmes will be on the outside of the third row. Mark Collingwood then on our next slide in seventh as Dane and Fairburn will start in P8. David Fernandez will begin from ninth while Michael McKinney rounds out your top 10. Rick Reinsberg will be 11th and Peter Coomer will start from 12th. Inside of seventh row is Lenny Holland, J.R. Gregory starting alongside him, Ben Lung and Mike Matson 15th and 16th, Mark Rondeau and Patrick Adamchik will round out our top 18, Scott Bowers and Michael Adams will be on the 10th row, Snelling and Glenn 21st and 22nd, Mario Gonzalez and Avijid Barua starting 23rd and 24th, and then our final three cars, Sherburn, Franco and Fricky. This is a very big field starting here at Daytona. Biggest field we've seen yet out of uh, all our classes here at Daytona. It means that there's probably going to be some shenanigans on lap one as everyone scrambles for position. Exactly. It's always the most dangerous time uh, in a race such as this single make uh, without multiple classes uh, out there all trying to file into that first corner and through the infield as well. We often will see problems into the international horseshoe as we uh, did get a, a, a wreck into there for the sport class on lap one. So crossing our fingers that we don't see that this time. As was mentioned, 19 Celsius on the track surface for uh, the uh, non-metric folks at 67 Fahrenheit, which is about as cold as it can get in iRacing on the track surface. 
so expect the cars to need a little time to get the tyres into working condition. Yep, the tyres will be cold. Of course, uh, GT3 start with tyre warmers, so they won't have to work as hard as they would in other kinds of cars to get the tyres up to temp, but the touring around on the formation lap means that the tyres are rapidly losing temperature, and of course, uh, there's not much in the way of weaving allowed on the formation lap. Pace car will jump into the pits momentarily, and we can take the green flag. There it is, pace car is in. Velez holds control of the field over Yoakum. And there it is, green flag is out. Ooh, it's a very good start for the 33. Backer suddenly starts to fall back as well. It looks like uh, Terrence Tong losing a couple positions here at the start as they go three wide on either side of him, plunging down into the first turn. So far, so good. Everybody giving plenty of space. Oh, and backer. nobody. Oh, no. Oh dear, Jochen Backer, he caught the grass and spun around, also seeing rejoining the track there, Dane and Fairburn. Disastrous start for Jochen Backer and for Dane and Fairburn there, who finds himself down in 19th Backer all the way at the rear of the field. Wow, just horrendous start for the 001. This will promote Jokel up to second, Nielsen into third. There is the spin off and you can see Fairburn managing a little bit better as he at least kept it pointed the right way but uh, uh, Yalcom will now trundle back to the pavement and carry on with a lot of work to do from here. Brett Holmes also finds himself into fourth from that one and Terrence Tong P5 for him. All right, well, uh, Klaus Nielsen will be happy with how the start's gone for him already up two places and looking to make it three. You see him right there in the slipstream of Matthew Jokel. Of course, he's not going to go right for it at the chicane. He'll be waiting for the slipstream into turn one, starting lap two. He's under a lot of pressure from Brett Holmes and Terence Tong, though. It's a long train of cars making their way out of the Le Mans chicane here on lap one. It's a draft train. Who's going to get the best run into turn one? Running high is uh, Peter Crummer, and he's getting chased down by Lenny Holland there. You just saw them uh, jump into view briefly there. It looks like Holland is going to get the slipstream and pass him into the first turn. Crummer is uh, going to let him go, and he's actually letting multiple cars go here. It might be a slowdown that Peter it, Kummer is dealing with. It was indeed. I can confirm. Checked on that as soon as I, I saw how much he was giving up there, and he, he served the penalty, but unfortunately it lost him significantly. He's down to 16th spot, as you can see, the bright green car of Bowers, and ooh, down to the inside, the black and white of Patrick Adamchik trying to see if he can sneak through. Almost looks like he managed to make that happen as we come back forward once again now. Bit of a battle for third as Klaus Nielsen has Brett Holmes behind him. Yeah, Nielsen didn't get the best of exits from the International Horseshoe on that lap. Uh, so he's under a lot of pressure right now. He's trying to nail his exits and stay in the slipstream of Matt Jokel. That's the thing about Daytona. We've said it multiple times before this week. You have to be within about a second of the car in front to start getting the benefit of the slipstream. Right now, looks like Nielsen is just too far back. And he's going to have to be looking over his shoulder here at Brett Holmes, who we ride on board with coming into the Le Mans chicane. Brief defense from Nielsen, but he knows that Holmes is not close enough to get up the inside. Probably not willing to throw the race away at this stage. Oh, oh into no. the wall goes Nielsen. This is That's... the scenario we were talking about. And that is the quickest commentator's curse I've ever seen, Joe. Uh, I think that's on you. <laughs> well, I was talking about Brett Holmes not willing to risk it at this stage. I didn't think Nielsen was going to oh. do something risky. Apparently just losing control briefly. What state is the car in? He doesn't have a meatball flag so he can carry on, but what is the pace like? Remember, the position he needs to watch out for is 17th or better. Yeah, and he's uh, fallen down to 10th as things stand. He did clip the wall and got a little bit of damage to the right-hand side. That will compromise his straight line speed. Fortunately, uh, fast repair is allowed in this series, so come time for the pit stop, Nielsen will easily get that car repaired and back up to tip-top shape, but he's going to have to suffer for the time being as the fuel burns off. Exactly, and I guess it'll be 
kind of weighing to see what sort of pace loss he's got to, to see if he needs to pit early or if he can manage to gut through it uh, towards the more optimal strategy of pitting later. We'll keep an eye on that pace ourselves as we move up ahead to uh, Fernandez, putting some pressure on Collingwood here. Yep, Fernandez trying to uh, grab fifth place here from Mark Collingwood, who had an excellent qualifying. Already pulling out of the slipstream with a bit more momentum here is David Fernandez. Is he far up enough alongside to get the move done? He is. Collingwood recognizes it and decides, okay, mate, you can just have that. And uh, I'll try and slipstream you into the first turn at the start of the next lap. Didn't quite nail the exit, though. Brings him under pressure from McKinney. And we still have Lenny Holland and Rick Reinsberg behind. Lenny Holland is uh, making up quite a few positions, isn't he? He currently holds the fastest lap of the race in the slipstream and uh, up four places. Nicely done by him. Also, don't need to go to it, but uh, Mike Matson. Had a bit of an off in the number 17. Well, we're going to watch it anyways. It's, uh, oh, I mean, basically a, a carbon copy of what we've seen many times now at this stage, just losing it into Le Mans. Yeah, that, that happens quite a bit, um, you know, especially in an open setup series where drivers will be playing around with the brake bias and trying to make the car turn a little more, stiffening the rear suspension. Uh, it becomes a problem on a fast corner entry like that. We have to nail the turn in just a little bit too much oversteer on the way in and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, Holland continuing here in ninth place. There was a little bit of side-by-side -side ahead of him in the first turn, but not much he can do until he gets to the oval section. Exactly, and there's so many cars in that train in front of him, so everybody's going to be jockeying for position, but they're all going to feel the toe. So will it even out, or will anybody actually get a shot here uh, to try and make a pass? Holland currently behind Reinsberg with McKinney in front of him, then Collingwood, who was overtaken by Fernandez that we saw this time at this corner last lap and this time it looks like David Fernandez is going to be well far ahead of him as he was uh, apparently being held up slightly and starting to gap his rivals checking in on Terrence Tong one of our two that mathematically have a shot he's sitting in fourth Jokel two positions up in second is already about uh, whew, two seconds up the road from Terrence yeah, and he's got a tiny bit of slipstream from uh, Julian Velez, who's uh, continued to lead the race the whole way through. In fact, Velez and Tong are the only drivers to still be in the position they started. A good catch on that one. As uh, Velez, our pole sitter, still leading this race. Dane and Fairburn heading into pit lane. I don't see a meatball flag. This is an unusually early call for a pit stop, but might potentially be able to get him to the end from here with a bit of fuel saving. Still not sure why he's going to go for this risky of a strategy. He'll have a heavier car. Yeah, he will. Um, uh, hope, he'll be hoping that there's uh, a little bit more in that or potentially uh, if there's a big enough incident out there, the uh, safety car will be called. So that could give him a chance to catch back up to everyone else. Regardless, uh, it's a bit unusual to see him pitting this early. There might be some other problems on his end that we're not aware of. Exactly, as uh, Collingwood and that bright green machine still being hounded by Michael McKinney. Uh, it's gone from him being second in line to now the leader of the train with Fernandez dropping them to over a second at this stage. And he continues to increase the gap corner by corner about a quarter of the way into this event as we jump back up to Jokel once again. Now he has been keeping Julian Velez on a, a decently tight leash here. It's close to about half a second. But before he had a gap down to Brett Holmes, you can see now that has gone away. Holmes has joined the trio. Yeah, Brett Holmes has had a nice run these last couple of laps. He's uh, right in the slipstream now and steadily gaining. Let's see what the lap times are like here across the start finish line. Looks like uh, Holmes actually the fastest of the top three and he holds the fastest lap of the race. So. This might be a mid-race charge here from Brett Holmes as, oh no, um, oh, actually, oh yes, I'm seeing uh, pit stops. Whoa. Oh no, that's not a pit stop. Oh lordy, 
I That's saw Nielsen. Klaus Nielsen. It is Nielsen. I saw him in pit lane, I thought, as he decided to go for a, for a pit stop, but no, I don't think he has. And it's going to be a black flag because oh. something happened, I think, in the trioval. Yeah, he had a tangle. We'll see. Uh, well, no, this is Snelling, so this is a separate incident. But Rondeau and Nielsen came together at one of the fastest parts on the track, and that sent Klaus into pit lane. Unfortunately, that's an automatic black flag for speeding or unsafe entry into pit lane. So things have suddenly turned upside down for our championship leader. Yeah, well, Nielsen was already uh, compromised for straight line speed, and it looks like the entire pack behind from Rondo back had caught up to him. And then, unfortunately, Rondo just coming down on Nielsen a little bit sent him all the way into pit lane. Richard Franco uh, also having some sort of issue and looks like the Western horseshoe. And so he'll get the car going, but that was a pretty big hit, so he's definitely going to have damage that will slow him down. Good news is race control looked at the start and they are saying uh, no penalties assessed. Everything was kosher on that one. That's good to see as we come back to our top three, Velez, Jokel, Holmes. This is perfect for Matt and Brett because now they can either uh, continue to attack thanks to the slipstream or they can use it strategically and try to save some fuel. Yeah, for Jokel, I'm sure he's aware that uh, there's been that huge problem for Klaus Nielsen, and he might see that as his cue to start pushing to try and take the lead. Um, th but the thing is, they still have the pit cycle coming up. Anything that he can do to save fuel will certainly uh, will help him in the pit cycle. Also noticed a problem for Michael Adams. He's fallen down the order and is now into 22nd. I think uh, there was a spin for him somewhere down the line, but we'll stay with the battle for the top three for now. Gently does it on your way onto the oval. Yeah, you're right about Adam's spin. I, I was watching that out of our box and uh, Kim Fricky had a very close moment when he tried to get going. Almost got an unsafe rejoin penalty, I'm sure, uh, for him backing up into the racing line, Adams. But thankfully, no contact as we uh, continue to watch uh, uh, this uh, battle that we've been seeing uh, between Collingwood, McKinney, Holland, Reinsberg. Here's the problem for Adams. Now, I just got bumped around. This, yeah. Now, watch this, though. Backs up. Oh, and thankfully, Fricky was very heads up. And that's a blind corner. He somehow knew to just give it a little bit extra on the outside. Yeah, as you said, good heads up driving there. Just seemed like a little bit of side by side into the first turn. And when a car turns in around the outside and you get bumped, then around is the only way you'll go. Uh, lead is still on here. It's a nice bit of momentum here from Matthew Jokel. It's also side by side for sixth place. Michael McKinney briefly lost it to Mark Collingwood and they'll be side by side into the first turn. And oh, oh, a spin for Lenny Holland. Lenny Holland, who was having a great run up through the field, has slid to the inside of turn one and collected the pit exit wall. He's out. Oh. That is horrifying to see. He's got a meatball flag. He has to take repairs. There's no guarantee he'll even make it back out on the track after that one. But as that happened, we've been watching Jokel, like you said, putting the pressure on and trying to do something with Velez here to see if he can shake him and make a mistake. This has got to be just a real crunch time for Matthew Jokel because I'm sure he's done the math himself and knows nothing but a win will satisfy at this point. He needs to finish ahead of that 33, but at Daytona, it's hard to guarantee that. Yeah, very hard indeed. I mean, if you if you make the slipstream pass too early, then your rival's just going to slipstream you back. I think for Jokel, it, it is priority number one to just save fuel and make sure that he can get the shortest pit stop he can and try and hold off Julian Velez and Brett Holmes uh, in the dying laps of the race. If you're looking for an update on Klaus Nielsen, he's down in 27th and dead last. He spent a minute and 26 seconds stopped in the pits repairing his car after the unfortunate incident we saw coming through the tri-oval. So he is now out of the points that he needs to keep the championship if Jokel wins. Uh, so many ifs on this one. 
And let's not forget, Klaus has, has also done his scheduled pit stop because of that. So now he's got a fresh car. Now he's got his pit stop out of the way. But how close is he going to be to anybody once they all take their pit stops uh, and cycle back out? We won't find out probably for another 15 minutes for everybody to finish up with theirs. Meanwhile, look at Matt just looking on either side of the Les, trying to fill his mirrors, see if he can psych out that uh, yellow and black car in any form or fashion, while at the same time having to watch out for homes behind him. This is always the worst position for you to be in if you're in a three-car battle, the middle car. What do you focus on? Do you focus on attacking or do you focus on defending? Um, you've got to try and focus on your corner exit so you can stay in the slipstream of the leader, but at the same time, you're looking over your shoulder at Brett Holmes thinking, is he going to try and go for a move somewhere down the line? I wouldn't want to be in Jokel's position right now. Look at the points, a tie as it stands right now between Klaus and Jokel, but uh, I believe uh, Nielsen is sitting on more wins. Yes, indeed, uh, Jokel only has one to the three that Klaus has, so he gets the tiebreaker for that one at this stage. Collingwood has been dealing with uh, uh, the, the cars filling his mirrors quite admirably. McKinney unable to take overtake so far and uh, coming up and around. This is actually a little bit far farther ahead. This is Fernandez. Ooh, passing Tong. Man, this has been a great one for David, who not only managed to pass Collingwood, but has tracked down a faster car, or a car that was ahead of him at least, and is already trying to go for another position. Seems like David Fernandez is, uh, has been focusing on his race pace rather than his qualifying pace. Wasn't quite able to nail the lap. Started in ninth and has made up four places so far. Of course, uh, one of them would have been for Klaus Nielsen having his problem at the chicane earlier on, which then compounded into the big incident that has now put him down, uh, a lap down in 27th place. It will be interesting to see what he can do from here. Terence Tong has been driving well over the course of the race, but Fernandez right in the slipstream down the oval section. There won't be much that Tong will be able to do to defend later on in the race, and that's if they come out together after the pit cycle. Yeah, good point. Uh, just don't know what's going to happen there. There's so many variables, and they have to push every step of the way to make the most of it. Collingwood still ahead of McKinney. Jared Gregory behind them, but they've lost Reinsberg. Somehow he's dropped off of this, and it's gone from a train to now just uh, uh, a triplet of cars, and then... As they come up into the braking, there's a big defense from Collingwood. Interesting that he feels that uh, under threat into a corner where it's admittedly kind of tough to overtake. Yeah, very tough indeed. Um, I mean, you want to you wanna try and make passes wherever you can, but the Le Mans chicane with its fast entry is uh, one of the places where you only really have a chance of making a pass if you have massive overspeed on the car in front or they've made a mistake coming onto the oval. No attack this time into the first turn from Jokel. He's going to stay line astern with Brett Holmes sitting behind him. So maybe he's trying oh. to think big picture. Oh, is he under attack from Brett? Yes, he's going to slip up the inside into the international horseshoe. Was not expecting that. I wonder if Matt was. He's got a black flag. Matthew what? Jokel has got a black flag. Um, I think... I think he might have picked up a slowdown in the chicane and didn't clear it in time. Oh, man. Crucial mistake. I can't believe it. This has got so many twists and turns, this one, as we go to Adam Schick now. Down in 17th is Zavajit Barua uh, behind him fighting hard for that P17. It looks like the 991 car going to try and chuck one up the inside of the Western Horseshoe, but... No room at the end. Patrick will shut the door. Kim Fricky, who failed to set a qualifying time, has been steadily climbing up the field. Yeah, Kim Fricky's had a, a pretty good race, not setting a qualifying time, of course, but now up into 19th and right behind a slipstreaming pack. 
Patrick Adamczyk at the head of it, and he has got no front bumper. Meanwhile, keep our eyes here on uh, Mark Collingwood and Michael McKinney. They've got J.R. Gregory drafting up to them now. I love the ebb and flow of the race here. All it takes is one delayed throttle application, and you've got another two, maybe three cars getting involved in a battle. Everyone's still so close together. Collingwood now having to defend from McKinney here, who's got a lot of overspeed in the draft. He'll be on the outside for turn one, and that usually isn't where you want to be. There goes the number 20 of Matthew Jokel to serve that black flag and maybe get his service done in the meantime. Yeah, but it'll be a long stop because of that. It looks like Collingwood will hold off McKinney down into the first corner. So Michael McKinney tired of hanging around behind him and in fact had another look up the inside into the International Horseshoe off screen there. So definitely making some moves as we check back in with first place. Because of our, uh, because of Jokel serving that black flag, it is now down to two fighting for this top spot and neither of them are in the championship hunt anymore. Oh, spin for Rick Reinsberg. Lost the rear on the way to turn one. Everyone avoids him, but he has to, oh, Okay, a little there bit of a tap they. there. Yeah, just a tiny bit of a tap. I don't think that's going to be worth much in terms of uh, in terms of damage. But yeah, um, I suppose uh, just a, another case of the rear end being lost. Same for Ooh. Joachim Backer as well, who, remember, had that disastrous start. Seems like he's still having troubles with the rear. A lot of drivers, surprisingly, looking like it. This is a tough one. And I guess some of that comes down to that, that open setup that they've got on the car, too. They, maybe a few have gone a little bit too far on trying to take away some of the downforce in this machine. Meanwhile, back to P1 and P2, four seconds ahead of Terrence Tong. So Terrence Tong is still in this one because he uh, is still within the podium, but it's a long ways away. He needs a great second half of this race to catch up and attack these drivers in P1 and P2. Indeed he does. Ah, it's going to be tough. Very tough indeed. Well, we're past the halfway point and the majority of our field has yet to come into the pit lane. Um, but uh, you'll be able to see that in probably the next few minutes. The fuel is burning off and it's around about this, this period that we start seeing the majority of drivers coming into the lane, getting that little splash and dash to get to the very end. I think the, the, the trailing drivers in each battle here, they'll be at the most advantage. They've managed to save in the slipstream. They'll be able to shorten their pit stops by a couple of seconds, but it's not just pit stop time you have to worry about. It's uh, getting into pit lane and getting into and out of your box as well. Yeah, and trying to uh, break into pit lane is always a bit tricky here. We've seen penalties for speeding before. Uh, in the previous classes as we're watching from uh, on board Velez looking back at Holmes now who has just been keeping himself within range of that number 33. We'll have to check and see if Brett has managed to take a win so far this uh, series 11 uh, 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 and uh, has managed to top the podium but I don't see him up in the point so I'm going to guess that he has not. In the meantime we're going to check in on Tong versus Fernandez. Yep, keeping an eye on the battle for third and fourth. David Fernandez still piling the pressure on Terence Tong here into turn one. Not going to be much of a change, but it does look like uh, Michael McKinney just behind has managed to get past Mark Collingwood finally after slipstreaming him for the longest time. Now up into the top five, but Collingwood will pass him right back. Um, I mean, if, if you're Terence Tong, this is a very difficult position to be in. You're miles behind the top two right now, and there's nothing you can do to gain on them, and you potentially face losing a podium spot here. At the moment, Terence Tong is the best place to take the title from Klaus Nielsen, but he's just not in the position he needs to be. So close, yet so far away. And I can tell you that uh, Brett Holmes, when I was able to check in on how he's been doing, he's got a single podium, a third place from race two at VIR. Otherwise, 
hasn't been able to come home first so far in Series 11. Meanwhile, this is the, the battle that just never ends, but Collingwood still doing such a fantastic job playing defense. He's And he's definitely had to play defense out there, uh, holding off the hard-charging Michael McKenney, who's tried to attack a couple times. He's once again going kind to of cover the inside down into the Lamar chicane. That's going to make for a slow entry, but all you need is the exit. And the exit is nailed. He manages to keep up the pace. Brett Holmes, meanwhile, Oh, here we go. That, that's the call potentially there from Julian Velez. He'll jump into the pit lane. Our leader is now in the pits. That is interesting to see. Velez has been leading the race the whole way. He would have been using all of his fuel. Wouldn't have been able to save. So he might have a longer pit stop. And this early stop here might be what Brett Holmes needs to take the lead. Oh, he has his uh, Velez finished second at Mugello earlier on last round actually so uh, this one step up would be huge for him I wonder if he's just trying to see if he can do a, a different stop from what Brett Holmes is planning on doing and uh, break that slipstream somewhat by running some good laps Fernandez is still behind Tong I'm kind of surprised Tong hasn't allowed him through since it seems like David's quite quick and, and allow him to either pull him forward or at least save himself some fuel. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Terence Tongs' head right now, but uh, we'll see if there's a clue to his late race strategy here um, once he pulls by the pit lane. The call had already been made by uh, our former race leader, and we'll see a bunch of drivers follow him in. We've already seen Collingwood, Backer, and Bowers make their way into the lane. They were all in a pack together, currently in 13th, 14th, and 15th. Meanwhile, McKinney staying out, same going for J.R. Gregory and Peter Kummer here. Through the chicane they come, and Michael McKinney's been the one um, who's been attacking, and he'll be careful now to save a tiny bit more fuel. Also, Holmes pits in in response, so he's not going to allow Velez to try and out-strategize him and uh, uh, get a jump during... Oh, Brett Holmes actually just disappeared for me. Hopefully mm. his internet connection has not gone south. I don't see... Oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, he no. has returned, but he scored a lap down. Oh, the no, that's massive. Okay, so I might have to uh, have a chat with race control here to see if they will give him his lap back or not, or if this is something that's just uh, one of the quirks of racing virtually that uh, his connection going out at exactly the wrong time has cost him a shot at the win. Yeah, potentially. Well, um, I'm looking uh, on my end and it looks to me like he's actually come out um, still scored on the lead lap. I think that might have been a little scare there, but it doesn't look like it's cost him anything. He's on the <laughs> same lap as Julian Velez, who's just resumed the race lead ahead of him. Okay, so it corrected itself. Thank goodness. Uh, I was hoping we wouldn't have some sort of craziness there. And yes, you're right. He is with Julian once again. And 12 minutes left to go now. So it's coming down to the final quarter of this race. We've seen pit stops for everybody at this stage. Tong actually gained a bit in those pit stops. It's down to 3.3 seconds now. Yeah, Terence Tong having a good time in the pits, apparently. Um, so comparing pit stop times, well, Velez, no surprise to see that his pit stop was the uh, longest out of the top four. Uh, it was about six, seven tenths slower than the stops for Holmes and Tong. Tong with uh, the quickest pit stop in the top four, incidentally. Uh, it was six tenths faster than David Fernandez, who's now having to work a little bit harder to get uh, onto the podium after what's been a long rise up from ninth place. Richard Franco has already had uh, a few scares this race, has gotten it repaired, but slips out from under him anyways, and uh, he'll get back racing, but with maybe a little bit of a slower lap. Now, what's interesting is I've been trying to follow Klaus Nielsen's progress and his laps have not looked good at all. They've looked well off the pace 
uh, compared to some of our, our higher runners. And surely he had dam uh, re uh, repaired that damage. Mm. I mean, yes, yes, he took the free repairs, so he should have had a clean car. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I think I think if, if you're Klaus Nielsen, you're off the lead lap. You're a lap down, and um, there's probably not much chance of you gaining position. So uh, all he can really do at this stage is just circulate and try and bring it home. Yes, he might finish uh, outside of the points, but uh, regardless, uh, his his main focus will likely be on the stuff that he can't do anything about, which is uh, the fact that Terence Tong is uh, up in third place, still looking for uh, a little bit extra from Matthew Jokel, who's fallen down to 19th as well. I think Nielsen knows that he's safe for the time being for the title. Oh, that's a big issue for Mike Matson. That's not the first time we've seen him go for a spin at the Le Mans chicane. This time, he hits the outside wall. Yeah. That's uh, going to be frustrating here right at the end of the race, especially if he now has to take another stop down pit lane. Holmes right on the rear bumper of the number 33 as we hop on board, watching them fly through the banking of NASCAR three and four. He's got a good run. Is he starting to time those runs now to figure out what it takes? Because we can sometimes see drivers snipe the win right at the line. Yeah, indeed. He's probably testing that out just behind him, coming across the start-finish line here. Lifts off a little earlier to allow Velez to get through turn one. A little bit deep for Velez, in fact, as uh, we check out once again Tong and Fernandez. The battle showing no signs of slowing down for the last spot on the podium. And I'll tell you what. Now that I think about it, with nine minutes to go and the battle for the lead intensifying, maybe Tong is uh, hoping that Holmes and Velez will become entangled, run side by side for a few corners, lose a second or two, and that could potentially open up the opportunity for him to take the win and the title. I think that's his best hope right now. So uh, Terrence Tong absolutely wants them to start fighting through the infield and maybe try and go side by side into the Lamar chicane, but... I don't know if Brett Holmes is going to fall for that one. He might just be trying to think a, a, a bigger picture here, waiting for that last lap. As we did see him try to go side by side a bit last time. Let's see what he does here as he's uh, being able to pull up behind his rival. Velez, interestingly, is defending, but then comes back to the racing line by the time they hit the braking. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone uh, fall that far to the inside of the track when defending a position before he does seem to have enough of a gap over brett holmes that he doesn't need to defend that hard but maybe once again it's uh, just a little practice run i mean he, he knows that brett holmes is gearing up for a slipstream run to the win he just needs to be prepared for that yeah and that time definitely was not the run for brett as he was well behind meanwhile between terence and Fernandez uh, definitely going to go side by side. And David, round the outside of turn one, is going to try and see if he can make this stick. He does, and he looks to be fully through. Terrence Tong now off the podium. Yeah, that's another blow there to his title hopes, but an excellent pass from David Fernandez. You don't often get it done around the outside to turn one at Daytona, but he managed to do it. Picked up the slipstream, got on the brakes nice and late, rotated the car perfectly, and uh, Tong had to yield on the way out. So that would make six positions for the 09 at this stage. Been just doing fantastically out there. Peter Krumer does one better up seven and checking to see if anybody is better than that it looks like mario gonzalez gained 12 along with chris sherburn who have uh, traveled from far back in the pack up to the heights of the top 15. watching from on board velez this is i i wonder if this is also maybe julian trying to break the slipstream a little bit but this time it doesn't work because brett follows him uh down into the inside and then all the way back to the outside because anything he can do to try and prevent Brett from getting close enough to, to use that slipstream would probably behoove him. Indeed it would. Oh man, this is, this is really crunch time, isn't it? Right at the end of the race. 
so much at stake here. Peter Kummer, it looks like, has had an issue at the chicane there. Oh, wow, yeah, he's slow. Re-emerging back onto the racetrack. Oh, dear. Kummer was running in fifth place. It was a great run up through the field from 12th. Let's see what happened to him here. Sent him back to where he just about gritted up. He's got a car behind him, but I don't think there was contact. Let's watch and see. Ooh, a lot of curb. Yeah, it was out of shape. And then from there, he was just trying to save it and unfortunately ran out of pavement. Yeah, it looks like the when he uh, ran across the grass on the exit there, the traction control kicked in um, and uh, just arrested the speed of the rear tires, which wouldn't have helped his recovery. That's the thing you got to consider in these GT3 cars. They do have anti-lock brakes and traction control, which can help you in most situations. But if you're off the track and the traction control kicks in, then uh, that just locks the rear tires. And unfortunately, there's not much you can do to recover. Yeah, good, great point on that one. And five minutes left to go. Brett Holmes is hoping that he doesn't have those sort of issues. Does look like Julian's starting to push now. Meanwhile, Checking in on Adam Chick here, coming through the banking. It's not a typical place to have an issue. Trying to figure out what's no. going on. Unless it happened at the uh, chicane here, did he lose the rear on the way in over the curb? And oh uh -oh. yeah, just on the power too much on the rotation and a little tap to the wall there. That's going to be more aero damage for him and more compromise. Well, Brett Holmes has fallen back a bit now from Julian Velez. They've got a lap car they're negotiating, Mark Rondo, who has uh, fallen back. Um, Rondo, of course, was the car that made contact with Klaus Nielsen earlier through the trioval, and race control gave him a penalty for that. So he is uh, off the lead lap now. No chance of a points finish. In fact, he's the car that's uh, a position ahead of Nielsen, who's down in 25th, while Mark running P24. Uh, only cars that are running lap down besides Holland, who is many, many laps down due to his early issues. Franco might join them pretty soon if he keeps spinning out like that, coming down through turn one. Yeah, turn one is such a deceptively difficult corner. It looks simple enough from the air, but the way you come in you have to be careful in the braking zone coming off the banking and then uh, it tightens up right in the middle so it's often one of the places where the car is the most unbalanced and it seems like many drivers have uh, had that same issue there just trying to keep the rear end in check and failing but the battle for the lead is continuing here only three minutes left on the clock i think we'll be coming round to start the penultimate lap here and the pressure is on for julian velez does he have enough speed to keep brett holmes from attacking him i think we're going to see franco finally have one that Ooh. kind of ends the night for him he did get the car going but with a monstrous hit like that he's going to be well off the pace and uh yeah, I can tell you that, uh, well, he doesn't have a meatball flag, surprisingly, but the, the car is just kind of limping around from here as we now watch the leaders, as you said, come around to two to go now. And Holmes has caught up to him, but he's still not close enough to try and be ahead at the line. Yeah, it's going to be all about his exit coming onto the oval and his exit from the Le Mans chicane. And uh, you, you talked about timing earlier. Well, it's all about the run out of Le Mans on the final lap. I think Holmes will want to time that perfectly. If he passes Velez before that point, then Julian's just going to slipstream past him on the way to the line. This is going to be quite the, the interesting end to this one. Tong's still in fourth and still about five seconds off the lead, so it's looking less and less likely he could get that win he'll need to, to take the championship. So Nielsen, a lap down in 25th out of 27 cars, will score no points, but somehow looking like he'll eke through to the championship. There you can see as it'll be a 17 point difference, it, it looks like, as it sits right now. Yeah, and you have to feel for Matthew Jokel as well. He's fallen down to 50, uh, fifth in the championship there with uh, the problems that he suffered 
Um, would have been a uh, very clear second place if he'd managed to hold on to the position he was in. He was ahead of Terence Tong um, before he had his unfortunate crash. So uh, regardless, I think he'll be able to take a lot away from this season. Did take a few wins on, um, on the ticker. So carry that through into next season, into Series 12. Meanwhile, Mark Collingwood, he's been involved in battles all the way through, hasn't he? Now he's got Ben Lung and Mario Gonzalez trying to chase him down. Yeah, and that's going to be for eighth position, but the white flag is now out. Velez and Holmes just crossed the line. That time it was closer once again, but still not side by side. Brett, who at one point looked like he had that run figured out, has not been able to capitalize on it. I wonder if Julian has figured out how to get a better, a good enough exit that Brett simply can't do anything about it. Yeah, I think he's he's just been practicing that all race long and just focusing on getting the best exit possible. Slow in, fast out is the way to go, as any racing coach will tell you. And that's exactly what Velez is doing right now. He's uh, giving up a little bit on entry and piling on the power on exit. There are the relative positions of everyone ever so briefly as we come on to the first real slipstream opportunity of this final lap. Now it builds up to the Le Mans chicane. Which of these guys is going to get the better exit? Holmes, I think just a little bit too far back and he's not getting the slipstream off Velez. He's not going to be close enough here. Maybe he will be on the exit. We'll see. Oh, he was mighty under the brakes. He gained a lot, but that's not where he needs it. He needs it here. And as they accelerate away, ironically, they've got Richard Franco ahead, which is going to give a toe to Velez. That might save him. Holmes is a lot closer now. I don't think this is going to be quite enough for him, but it's going to be tight as they accelerate to the line for the last time in Series 11. He's gaining. He's gaining. It's going to be close. He's pulling up alongside him, but as they cross the line, it is King Julius today as he finally wins in Series 11 at the final race of Asking. Beautiful stuff from Julian Velez. That was a perfectly executed race. He led all the way apart from his pit stop. I don't think you could ask for much better than that. Terrence Song came home in fourth in the end. It was not enough with Klaus Nielsen actually heading to the line with him being a lap down. There he is, unofficially. That is your champion in the 04 today. It did not go as expected, but somehow the crisis was averted as Klaus takes the title. Yep, the cards didn't fall his way initially, but they fell his way elsewhere in the field. And those live standings tell the full story there. Terence Tong 17 points behind. Velez getting third in the championship at the final round. Looks like Jokel, meanwhile, um, has managed to managed to gain a couple more spots and put himself in fourth in the series standings. So congratulations to him for that. But I think it will still sting losing the potential for the title there at the final round. Indeed, Velez, though, with a strong ending to the season for sure. As uh, that is going to wrap it up, as here are your unofficial results. Julian Velez taking the win by eight hundredths of a second over Brett Holmes. It got a little nervy for him, but he still managed to win. David Fernandez with a, a classy run up into third from ninth on the grid to take a podium at the last round. Terrence Tong was P4 as Michael McKinney gains five spots to finish fifth. J.R. Gregory was up eight to get a sixth position. Uh, Backer, unfortunately, only able to collect seventh after a bit of a disastrous start, but still great job climbing back through the field. Uh, Mark Collingwood will finish eighth and Ben Leon will be ninth. Mario Gonzalez rounds out your top 10, gaining 13 spots. 11th place for Scott Bowers in the end, up eight places. Nicely done there. Chris Sherburn, he started down in 25th place and manages to get 12th. Excellent job there from Chris Sherburn, who really flew under the radar in this race. Reinsberg finishes in 13th, Kuma 14th, Avjit Barua 
uh, manages to get a top 15 from 24th place. Kim Fricky not setting a qualifying lap, gets 16th place. Adams, uh, Jokel, Adam Chick, and Fairburn will round out the top 20 in Jokel and Fairburn. That'll definitely sting, starting third and eighth, respectively. And then Mats and Franco, uh, the last two cars on the lead lap. Snelling, Rondo, Nielsen, a lap down. Uh, it's not going to mean much for Klaus Nielsen, though, because he is still the champion. David Glenn and Lenny Holland, unfortunately, finishing way off the mark. So there are your unofficial results for this race, which is going to wrap up the Series 11 races for the club class. But we have one more to go. So make sure and join us tomorrow night, April 11th, for the pro class here at Daytona. A big thank you goes out to the steering committee at PCA Sim Racing, as well as our team tonight, Reese, Ramiro, and Cameron. Thank you so much for watching tonight's broadcast of PCA Sim Racing. I'm Joe Peak. Race clean, race hard. We'll see you on the track.